having spoken to many actors, I know nothing helps them more than wardrobe. Even like walking into Arthur's apartment for the first time for Joaquin, I don't think has the same effect as putting on the clothing. Putting on that skin, so to speak, helps actors that final step in. When we first meet Arthur, he is very much a John Q. Public, so to speak. Not much style, it's very practical. There's a vague young man aspect to it, but there's also vaguely an old man look to it, too. Where ultimately the Joker outfit comes from is something very organic. The Joker look, which is so important to so many fans and people and so iconic in, in every version that the Joker's been out, you can imagine their, you know, wardrobes. And we wanted to do the something different but similar and you know, it was just it's just a lot of discussions. I love the fact that there was a suit written into the script. The suit that he wears on stage at the comedy club is actually the same suit that he is as Joker, but we kind of subtly change the tone of the fabric and hope you don't really notice, but it's really always that same suit. When we had our final fitting for the suit, it was all put together with the right shirt, with the right waistcoat, and the fit of it was kind of really dead on 70s, where it's a little longer line in the jacket. Joaquin was very excited about it and he took on this different kind of slinky, sexy walk, which is just right for this guy at the end of the story. We talked a lot about how skinny should Arthur be and how far do we want to go, and I kept saying to him, when are you going to start losing weight? Like, at what point do you start this? Because it was already, like, June, and uh, he hadn't started, and we started shooting in September, and he's, like, 180 pounds, which... He wasn't fat, but he was, we we're talking about getting to 125 pounds. And he goes, I, I got it, I got it, I got it. I go, well, you know, we can hire a guy, I got this thing, this woman who's a nutritionist might wanna, no, no, that's not how I do it. I go, how do you do it? He goes, I just stop eating and I starve myself. And he just ate an apple a day <laughs> for the whole summer. When I laid eyes on him at a table read, he had lost 50 pounds. He was a shell of himself. He was fully immersing himself into the role. We never rehearsed the character. We never talked really specifically about what he would do. All we really talked about was script and story and character, but we never talked about how are you gonna do it, you know what I mean? I think his process is one of surprise for himself. We were working spontaneously, which was just the flavor of this movie and what made the most sense for it. It was something that you really couldn't figure everything out in advance. We had to find it in the moment. And so you need a director that thinks that way. There were all these changes sort of that kept happening as we were filming and as they were sort of discovering the story and seeing what they had and seeing, oh, the story can move in this direction or that direction. And before we would shoot on a day, me and Joaquin and Scott and Todd would meet up in Todd's trailer and sort of rewrite scenes together and then we'd have it printed out and that's what we'd be doing that night. And I've never really worked with somebody who is so open to shifting as the story needs it. Well, Todd, first of all, is viciously smart and his willingness to just go outside of any boundary to tell the story that he wants to tell, it's very hard to put him in a box. I mean, the first thing he did was a documentary about Gigi Allen. And I think once you become uh, notable as a comedic director, a lot of people definitely see you as just that. But I've always known that he's an auteur. There's so much that comes up on a comedy that is spur of the moment, whether it's improvisation or just, you know, it'd be really funny if we do this and you just sort of throw a wrench in the whole thing and you do it because you're servicing the joke. Well, working with Joaquin wasn't all that different and you needed to be facile. Todd would come up with these great lines spontaneously and I would usually doubt them and make him feel bad and say that he's wrong and it's a bad idea. And then I would try it and I'd go like, that's really, that was, a, that was a really great line. I mean, he consistently did that. He's also really good at identifying kind of rhythmically things that weren't working in the scene and would come up with really great solutions um, to them in the moment. We had scripted a scene where 
Arthur runs into the bathroom and he has to get rid of this gun that he had been given that was now evidence. And so he pulls the grate off the bathroom wall and he hides his gun in there. And then he kind of washes his face, the makeup off his face and all this stuff. And when we got in the bathroom that day, it was just me and Joaquin and we're standing there, we're kind of, well, should we put in this grate? And we just start talking about, does Arthur really care about evidence? And does Arthur really care about, does he even know enough? Like, what did he see this in a movie? Like, hide a gun? Like, why does he even, why is it even in his language to do that? And then we're like, yeah, let's not do that. Oh, okay, well, what should we do? That scene was the second or third week or something like that. It was very early on. And for me, it was really a defining moment, both for the character, but also for me and Todd's dynamic of working together. It was originally envisioned a different way, and we talked about kind of the possibilities, and we couldn't really land on anything. It was really hard to identify what it was that we were after. And Todd was great. He said, let's just go onto the set, just alone, just you and me, and let's talk it through. And it really seemed like it was a moment that had to be about the emergence of Joker. We were literally in there for an hour, and we were at a standstill. We hadn't really figured it out. And I said, I, you know, it almost seems like it's um, it's a dance, but not not big movement, not a happy dance, but some kind of movement. I don't know what it is. And I said, oh, you know, I got this great piece of music I want to play you uh, from the composer. I think it's great, and I've just been listening to it all night. She sent it to me yesterday, and uh, so I played it for him and he loved it, and he just started doing this dance to it. It was this beautiful, kind of mournful cello piece, and he said, oh, maybe I would, would just start on your on your foot. And so then we we just said, okay, that's, we, we didn't talk about it more than that. We said, let's just set it up and shoot it. And I think it's a really great moment in the movie, and it's a really much more effective way of illustrating the beginning of a transformation with grace that kind of comes out of nowhere. You kind of feel that he has it in him. You know, we wrote in the script, there's a certain elegance to him and a certain romance in him when he holds the door for the woman and puts his foot out with a little bit of flair. The way he dances in the beginning of the film as a clown, he has it in him. There's music in him, so to speak. But that's the first time we really see it come out. Part of finding those moments, I have to say that I you know, worked with this choreographer named Michael Arnold for a couple sequences, and he'd introduced me to a lot of idea about movement and dance. In particular, one clip that he showed me, which was Roy Bolger, and it's a song called The Old Soft Shoe. And for some reason, it encapsulated, for, for me, like Joker trying to kind of come out, trying to emerge. Joaquin's the most nimble actor I've ever worked with. He just doesn't get stuck in anything. It's kind of otherworldly. It's unlike any other performance I've ever seen. He's so in his character from the get-go, and he's filled with wonderfully inspiring ideas. You get an actor like that, you know you're going to have a plethora of takes and points of view and ways to go and, and modulations. And then it's just about uh, honing that uh, you know, musically in the edit. It was so much fun to work on the edit of his stuff. It's what you wish for as a director. We've been editing this movie for so long because there's 18 trillion versions of this movie just based on the way he would do things so differently every time. You would come over to him and give him one line of direction and it would literally change everything in a great way. And he was just never locked into one thing. It seemed like it was the only way to, to, to do it. Because you have a character that's so erratic, and he's not really certain of what he's gonna do. And so it felt most true and most exciting and dangerous when we didn't really know what was gonna happen. Hey, Arthur, I heard what happened. Sorry, mate, there's a scene we had in the dressing room where, you know, he's just been fired and he's, he's meant to be leaving. And one time he decided to come back in and punch the clock, literally. I forgot to punch out. <laughs> and uh, smashed it off the wall and we're all just kind of like, wow. I think a lot of the movie works because there's tension. Really, you feel it with everything that Joaquin does in the movie. 
was hard for him. He really kind of went into the character and it was fascinating to watch someone really embody the absorption of a new identity. Hey. There's many ways to look at the movie. He might not be Joker. This is just a version of a Joker origin. It's this, the version this guy is telling in this room at a mental institution. I don't know that he's the most reliable narrator in the world. You know what I'm saying? You take you know, Todd and Scott and Pieces of Me and Catherine Hepburn and Frankenfurter and you put it all together and that's our Joker. I don't think that any of us really knew that that was going to be the ingredients for it, but that's just what happened.